I'm going to take you through um, um, a journey of uh, my life. Um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, what I've done right, uh, what I've done wrong. Um, as you all know, I've uh, the last couple of years invested uh, for the Kinevik Group in the Samwer Brothers. Um, quite some disruptive perspective of running business. Uh, loved by few, hated by many. Um, but during all my life, I've always been, you know, really, really obsessed with what drives a game changer. What is the things that disrupt the world? Why can we do things different? And how can we challenge those big corporates like Microsoft or telco companies in the world? And I, I've been willing, nearly obsessed, to team up with people like Niklas Sandstrom that have been chased by lawyers all over the world because I saw a great potential in their idea. But even more important, I'm going to talk about all my failures. Because one of my key learnings during all my years is that, you know, you have to take risks and you need to fail. So, let's see if we can do this together. I think, you know, the, the joint competence in this room is much, much greater than mine. So, see if we can add to this. And, you know, all of this sales perspective, I've, I've, as I said, I was fascinating, you know, how, does, how do you disrupt companies? And I had the the opportunity, actually, of, of starting to work for Jan Stenbeck, you know, at Kinevik, and then I came back to Kinevik, but as a CEO assistant. And this was, you know, great, because I thought this is, you know, a very big company, interesting, but as a CEO assistant, you cook coffee, you repark cars, you do a shitload of PowerPoints, then we bought a couple of companies and we IPO'd two companies. And what is tradition still at Kinevik is that after this year, you become the CEO of a subsidiary. Again, felt totally natural for me. Spent one whole year with top management and I had a double degree in both economy and technology. So the path was clear. I became the CEO of one of the subsidiaries. So what is the first thing you do when you enter in as a new CEO? Anyone? Fire someone. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> it gives you authority, huh? You're fired, you're fired, totally random. <laughs> Leave. I don't like you. Don't like your shoes. <laughs> oh, so, but... That's not really what we learn at school. What do we learn at school? You need a strategy, huh? Of course, you have to redo the strategy, huh? And this was great because I was really good at PowerPoints. And I could sit behind my desk without meeting any customers. But then it really, really hit me. The only thing I was going to be evaluated on was sales. And this is where Excel comes in really, really handy. Have you ever thought about how easy it is to add customers in Excel? <laughs> you know, just copy and drag, you know. <laughs> Everything goes up. But when you're sitting there and looking, okay, this is the plan I need to follow, you know. Panic. So what do we do if you're a CEO and have no clue on how to run a company. Yeah. Hire McKinsey. Hire McKinsey. I couldn't afford that, you know, <laughs> not at that point. Maybe, you know, the other advice I was, you know, was employ, you know, a, a sales director. Now, of course, that would have been a great solution. Um, but I was young. I was naive. I thought, you know, I really need to learn this. This seems to be important. Now I'm much older and wise, and now it's great, you know, you just employ a sales director, and then you distance yourself from the person, so everything goes to shite, you can fire him later. <laughs> that was a, well, that's a great idea. Do you think I did that? No, I had to leave the office. <laughs> Meet a lot of customers, scary, huh? So what do you think I got for advice then? Well, the advice I got was that I needed a marketing agency. <laughs> we couldn't sell anything before we had a great branding campaign. Huh? Felt again, totally natural. 
I could go around to the coolest agencies in Stockholm, drink coffee and have a great time. And they came up with a brilliant strategy. It will only cost about 30 million Swedish crowns to really get started. Shinovik is a big company, you know, they can afford it. So I thought, you know, back again up to Shinovik, you know, big office, top floor, sit outside and wait. And I basically only had two points on the agenda. The first is I needed a new billing system, and then it was those 30 million Swedish crowns. You sit outside, you get called in, you know, you get, ah, how are things doing out the real world? Do you like it? You want to say, yeah, it's good, you know, we're going to make this big. Okay, so what's the part on your agenda? Uh, first part, I need to buy a new billing system. And then I can see how Jan Steinbeck just goes like, oh no, and he basically throws his pen on the table and he literally screams at me, you idiot, why do you need a billing system? You have no customers. <laughs> and then I get rid of the second point and I leave, <laughs> telling him, well, I'll be back with customers. Mm, this was basically, you know, really falling down, first really falling down moment, you know. Spent five years at the university, have no clue how to run a company. So what do you do? It's a bit early to kill yourself. <laughs> so it actually ended up, I called my father. And he wasn't quite surprised. He said, you know, Jonas, you have never ever asked for advice ever in your life before. <laughs> you must be in serious shit now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't have any clue about selling. Well, so I'll, I'll, I have a friend who's a friend. I'll connect you with him. And he gave me a brochure that said, Hundra knack, tio snack, ett tack från en framgångsrik Electrolux försäljare. And this was the first time I came in contact with with defined as, you know, a classical pipeline model. Now this um, brochure had a very definite tricks, you know, how you should put your foot in the door and put your hand over it and stuff like that. But it told me one very important lesson. And that was sales is math. 100 knock on the doors, 10 talks, one yes. To 200, you sell more. It's frequency. I could relate to that. It's technology now. How can you just increase frequency and faster and faster and faster? So if you sell telco services, how do you increase frequency? Have we started calling people, of course, huh? And according to these kind of models, when you call all of Sweden and got a lot of no's, what do you do? You call them again, of course. It's just your first no to yes. And we were engineers, you know, we thought, you know, calling took a lot of time. We know we're clocking people out, oh, this is, takes too long time. So we had computers calling, you know, random people and connecting them to the call centers. You think it worked? It actually did very early on because no one was doing it. But the only thing here I learned was basically, how can you increase frequency? And I would like everyone to actually think, how good are you at frequency? Adding more customers in your, in your company. How can we make it go faster? Because if I look at some of the most successful companies out there in the world today, they're manic about tracking customers. We heard it at that top line, you know, 50% of the space is done for sales, growth. And I'm still surprised here in the Nordic, we take this subject so easy. But how do you increase frequency? And how do you know all of this? And then people say, well, I'm a technology guy, you know, I don't do that. But that's more, even more important. Because today, sales is the technology. You know, it's the pipeline. It's your Google Analytics. Where do you get your customers? What are the conversion rates? And how can you innovate in that? How can you think beyond? 
But for me, starting understanding how important frequency was, I moved on, started another telco company, started another one, and everything I did when I came in was basically, how do I increase frequency? And I don't know, but my, my army lieutenant, he always said to me, you know, in Sweden, we have ett skott, ett träff. But I went over to the US guys, and they just fired at everything. <laughs> and it seemed to be working, you know. So I thought I found the holy grail of running a company. I was called by a headhunter, and I was asked to head a company called Lycos Search. How many here have remember? Huh? Great. The world's second largest search engine in the world. Great. Now these, this was a company owned by Berkelsmann and Terra. It had enormous resources. We're going to take this to the total next level. But what do you think happened basically the same day as I started? Google. <laughs> a shitty little company in Palo Alto. And now if you are part of an executive committee at a big German company like Bertelsmann, what does the management do when they see a little shitty company like Google? Nothing, of course. And when they haven't gone away, we ignore them. Eh? And what do we do then? We laugh at them. They don't even have a business model. <laughs> How will they ever succeed? And when they still don't go away, what do we do? Someone came up that maybe we should try to buy them. And then some of the M&A guys went over, they came back and they just laughed. You know, what kind of valuation is that? Google talked about always delighting the user. This was totally f new for me. For all my life, everything had been about always delighting the shareholder. And I came to my German boss and I said, you know, Felix, you know, they're kicking the shit out of us, you know. We need to do some outside of the box thinking here. And then he told me, you know, in his Swiss German, like, Jonas, there is a reason we have the box. Because you should be inside the box and not outside the box. <laughs> you know, in Google they talked about content is king. Then I went back, no, no, sales is King Kong. And I just pushed my frequency throttles. But I totally failed. So what was Google doing? They built a better product. And that's not fair. <laughs> if you're a simple sales guy. Give me something that is equal to something else, I'll sell the shit out of it. They delighted the customer. So what comes out? So what's the light? Anyone? What comes to mind when you think about the light? Sex, great. Can you explain more why that delights you? <laughs> it's a great feeling, huh? Hard to explain. I think that goes with delight. Anyone else? I think we, we learn at school unique selling proposition. And I think some of those, but this is more about really doing the great things. We have taken this model from the hierarchy of customer needs. We're basically delight is on top. How many here has heard about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Basically works the same way. Huh? Let me give you an example. Alfa Romeo. Any Alfa owners here? They become less and less. They have a beautiful design as their delight. The problem is if the car doesn't go from A to B, 
the whole delight with the car falls very <laughs> rapidly. Then maybe if they're an alpha owner out here, they say, well, I get the personal relationship with my mechanic. <laughs> but that's not delight, you know. And I think that's, you know, a, a very interesting perspective around it. So, the light is what is communicated. It's what really drives. It's what the customers tell the stories. This company had a very clear delight. What was it? Safety. Safety. What is it today? Mm, is it? I'm uncertain. Made by Sweden. Scandinavian design. I think it's been quite unclear during a period of time. Do you think their market share is bigger before than it is today? Before. Why? Well, the challenge here, if we take this, is that during a period of time when they added safety features, there's customer satisfaction increased. But what happens to that delight if you innovate in your 24th airbag? For your knees, all cars are rated five stars in NCAP. Well, if you're unlucky, it falls down and becomes a functionality. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges I see because I work both with incumbents today and I also work with entrepreneurs. Is that entrepreneurs, they often have a very clear idea of what is our delight, what we want to accomplish. Their challenge is often the efficiency and functionality is not in place, no personnel, no money, no everything is chaos. But they have a great idea of how they want to innovate. But in contrary, if you take the biggest companies with the big resources, they have huge problems in trying to innovate into the future delight. Why is that so? Go back to yourselves. How many in your company is working with tomorrow's delight? Because if we know that eventually your today's delight will become efficiency and functionality, if that's the case, you'll have to sell the shit out of it. So let me give an example. Harley Davids had a huge problems during the 80s. You know, they were facing some serious competition from Japanese motorcycles. They were faster, you know, had better quality, were cheaper. So if you're a US CEO at this point in time, what do you do? Resign? Resign? No, not, not directly. The first thing you do is you call your local senator and say, this is not okay, this is cheating. <laughs> so they got 15% import tax on US motorcycles. But how they then tried, it didn't work out, you know. Harley-Davidson had a customer group of Hells Angels, not very good payers. The motorcycles broke down, they were loud. So over time, the company went into re reconstruction. The management team had to leave and basically say, how do we save this company? Went into a resort and said, okay, now we need to lock ourselves in. What are we selling? And what they came up with is, what we sell is the ability for a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and have people be afraid of him. That is our delight. <laughs> and this is our innovation attempt. It wasn't about selling motorcycles anymore. It was basically selling an outlaw dream. And then be really, really successful about it. So my perception is, innovate, don't imitate. This is really, really hard. And then see, maybe you say, but Jonas, you invested in the Summer Brothers, the copycats of the world. Yes, they copied the pain, but I would say they innovated enormously how to aggressively run an expansion operation. 
Because if you only copy everything, you will always be second. They had a very, very clear idea how they should integrate and grab market share. They were winning on the sales side. And the rapid deployment of money. They're hiring, they're firing. That's where they innovated. Second thing, does everybody in your company know what you're selling? Yes, great. Because the challenge is sometimes when I walk in to a management group, the first thing I ask them is, what are you selling? And in many, many, many cases, there is not the common view. There's a blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the bigger the companies, the more blah, blah, blah. Because what we learned today is creating a friction-free storytelling is super important today. With all the fuss that goes out there, if you're not super crisp, what you are adding for value to your customers, how should you survive? And trust me, I get amazed more and more times when people actually don't know this. Because in the end, if you can get your customers to tell their friends about your great delight, when well, life is really good. And then maybe you say, okay, maybe delight is something you, you find over a weekend when you go away with your, with your friends and family or your, your, uh, your executives. But I had the opportunity to have Stefan Passion in my board when I was doing the telco perspective. I was really focused in selling, you know, because I had to sell enough, you know, equipment every week to be able to pay my salary. But he talked very passionately how hard it had been for him to find his delight. It took him nearly 10 years to nail it. They come from a small town in, in, in outside of Stockholm, Westeros. They had a very clear idea of how to sell things. You know, it was in on the rack, and then it was the discount rack, then it was the discount discount rack, and then it was the super saver box. <laughs> nothing that went into the store, nothing went out without being sold. Then they moved to Stockholm, and constant fighting starts. We can't do this model, we need a different assortment, so on, so on. So they meet. From a P&L perspective, what do you think was the most successful? The Westerås or the Stockholm office? The Westerås, huh? Lower rent, less cost for personnel, a clear model with no cassations. Stockholm, much more undefined model. There's only one little challenge. Stockholm is a much bigger market. And rich. So how do you do? And this was a constant debate. How do we solve it? Until they came up with the definition H&M is from today on a fashion company. If Prada can use supermodels, so can we. If Gucci is on the high street, Fifth Avenue, so should we. But we're going to price everything with a zero less on the price tag. If Prada takes $300 for a pair of jeans, we'll take 30 but from today on, we're a fashion company. It's a quite bold move, huh? Guys, you've done a great job here in Westeros, put, made all the money, but I'm going to go with these guys, the fuck-ups in Stockholm. And we're going to take it to the next level. But that's what they did, and they launched you know, the very famous campaign with Cindy Crawford and so on and moved on. Never looked back, and then they started you know, doing things with big brands and so on. Really positioning themselves as a fashion brand. And done really, really well. And if you look from an interesting perspective, since we looked about the you know, stock prices, this has basically been H&M's. The interesting part through this, for me, is that when they did this, there was another company that basically was they exactly the same size. Kappal.
They didn't nail their delight. Still struggling. So I think the important lesson here is trying to understand what is your delight? What are you selling to your customers? And how can you innovate in it? But we talked about frequency, super important. We talked about the importance of delight and how it fits together. But yes, you need a business model. Trust me, I worked on a lot of VC companies and over time you need to make money. And I had the opportunity to be part of uh, Skypes. You know, we had, I had miserably failed at Lycos. So one of the key criteria for me when joining a new company was it needed to be a strong delight. But what is the strongest delight on a telephony service? Quite commodity, huh? Should we price it 50% lower than Telenor? 20, 70, how, how should you price it? So, but if we want to be true to ourselves and to the consumer delight, it should be, the cost should be zero. But that puts a, quite a lot of constraints on to your business model. So we started what we defined as the zero game. And this was not finding you know, zeros in, in, um, on, the, on the pricing side. This was more about how could we innovate on the cost side. If this is a telco, and this was Skype, a telco invests in infrastructure. At Skype we said, let's use the internet. And we innovated in our first zero. Second part, in a telco you need a switch. Interesting part here is that the CPU power was the same in a switch as in a personal computer. So we said, let's code and transmit the calls in the computer. Another zero. To get really good voice quality and connect all of these you know, different computers, you would need to go around the world and rack a lot of voice over ga IP gateways. How many here, by the way, use Skype? Oh, great, yeah, still, still being used. Have you ever come back to your computer and felt that the computer was really hot and the fan was going? Because if that's the case, your computer has become a super node and all traffic is routed through that computer. Because what we realized is that there are a lot of computers out there with a lot of CPU power connected to the internet but not being used. So we said, let's use all of that CPU power and as, a, as a router, as a super node. What do you think my old telco professor at Sw Stockholm Royal Techno School of Technology would have said? And if, if I went to him at that point of time and said, hey, we have an idea. We thought about routing a lot of traffic through people's computers without asking them and basically killing their CPU power because it's not being used. He said, I'll be crook, you can't do that. But our beliefs in having, you know, zero pricing said, why? We're willing to take the risk. Because it's better to have the service free of charge and doing this than opposite. So we did. Innovated in another zero. Since I run two telcos, I knew that, you know, customer service was one very high cost for a lot of companies. Then we said, okay, let's make it impossible to call Skype. <laughs> let's not have any phone numbers on our business cards. Let's not have anything where you can call us ever. The only thing we'll do is a big uninstall button. Don't like it, leave. We innovated in another zero.
The beauty around this also made the product very, very fast to scale. And then you go back to Tom's work at Stanford, and you start doing researches about these big, big companies that really accelerate very fast. We often see they have a great delight, but even more important, they have innovated in zeros. They don't have costs where others have. It gives them a competitive advantage. So, name any companies that have been successful in this. Spotify, yes, to some extent, they've been able to get down the pricing for music in a very, very good way against the music labels, and in that sense, they have no cost for music, or very little. The Pirate Bay, they maybe did it even better. They really innovated in zeros in to an extent where they actually went to jail. We can have a long debate about, you know, the perception of doing that, and Niklas coming from Casa, you know. Um, well, you know, I'm still amazed, though, that, you know, they can go to jail, but you can still produce weapons and sell them. But, you know, let's, let's not take that on stage. <laughs> Other companies? Dropbox. Dropbox is a great example, you yeah? uh, I think what they've done is brilliant, is they have innovated in zeros in their customer acquisition engine. They got a lot of people to actually, you know, add the customer because the it fuels the system. What's up, to some extent? What about this company? First, is there any delight flying with Ryanair? No. Do they have a clear business proposition? Yeah, it's cheaper. Huh? But I would say they've even taken it further, you know. Before coffee was free at Ryanair, you have to pay. Luggage before was free, now we have to pay. Do they call a normal landing air, the normal airport and say we want a better fee for landing? No. What do they do? Yeah. Get you know a call to an old airport, uh, army airport, and basically tell the government if we're going to land there, you pay us two million dollars. They're like, no, that's not how the system works. Yes. <laughs> and they get their money. They have not only innovated in zeros, they have innovated in customer acquisition revenue. Do you think if you work for Ryanair, you get paid? <laughs> You're a bit uncertain now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if you work for Lufthansa, you get your training paid. Do you think you get your training paid for at Ryanair? No, you have to pay for it. Lufthansa, you get your suit. Do you get your suit at Ryanair? No, you have to pay for it. Any pilots in here? So when you're finished training, what do you need? Well, you need 4,000 hours of training before you can become a certified pilot. And during that period of time, Ryanair is so nice that they lend out their aircraft for free. <laughs> There's only one pilot certified, the other one is always a trainee. <laughs> They've even gone so far today that if you want to send in an application to work at Ryanair, they charge you 40 euros. <laughs> so what do you think has happened with the number of applications? Gone down, eh? What do you think has happened with the quality? Gone up, huh? Who wants to send in a shitty application if you pay for 40 euros? We're all managers. So what can we do now? We can rationalize, huh? We can fire a lot of people at the HR department. And we get better applications. So it's gone so far now that HR is a profit center. Think about that. Go back to your HR people tomorrow <laughs> and say, my guys, you're only costs today, but tomorrow you need to find a way to be a part of the profit stream, otherwise you're fired.
But I think the interesting perspective around this is that, you know, today Ryanair is one of the most successful companies, airline companies in the world. Clear value proposition and they innovated around the innovation in zeros. What about IKEA? Normal brick and mortar company, no rocket science. Assemble your furniture yourself. Get, bring it out from the warehouse. And you get it in a very cheap way. Become a huge, huge, one of the biggest companies in the world. But the interesting part here with IKEA is how do they work with customer acquisition? What happens when you walk into a store? Yeah. It's basically the only system in the world. We have to walk through all the aisles. We have a team of 50 people down in Delft thinking about customer acquisition. How do they think they think? If they want to add customer acquisition, what do they do? Add more aisles, of course, you know, because then they increase frequency, yeah? Restaurant in the middle, of course. Everything is thought through, you know. Nothing is random. You pick up your warehouse, pick up your own stuff, come to the cashiers. What happens after the cashiers? Sausage, eh? What do they charge the sausage for here in Norway? Five krones, yeah, you even know it. Fem nook. That's a good price for a sausage, yeah? But not all stores are owned by IKEA. Some are still franchise. So some of the franchise owner came with the conclusion, you know, after going through all of this system, the customers are devastated. So, you know, you know we can easily add a zero to this and make more money. Then Ingmar Kamprad comes along. Do you think he thinks this is a great idea? No. He is furious. Why? Kills the delight. Kills the delight. He's built a brilliant sales formula where he's, you know, taking his customers all the way around here and they're happy all the way. Add more lines and more lines and more lines. Because the last thing he wants the customer to remember is yeah. Yeah. it was cheap and what are you going to do when you come home? Assemble the furniture and you should not do that on an empty stomach. <laughs> How often you go to Ikea do you come home with what you intended to buy? And if you can't come back there, you have, what happens if you didn't find what you were looking for, that last thing was missing? You have to go back. And I think it started with a, you know, um, getting CapEx costs down, as in getting warehouse costs down, but they realized there were a lot of things missing. But what happens? The customer has to come back. And then, they know that you will spend 2,384,000 Norske Kroner. And then maybe you say, ah, well, you know, there, you know, there's some, you know, there's some shortcuts now at IKEA. Anyone use them? Yeah? But why would they do that? For the husbands. Because the husband is often sent back to get the last missing item. And we don't want the husband to get caught in some kind of infinity loop. Eh? <laughs> <coughs> but what IKEA has done is that they have really innovated in their way of doing frequency. They build it into their product. So there's a smile on the faces all the way you go through here. But what more have they done? Oh, I think we missed it. But they've done something more. The catalog, yeah? Ingvar Kamprad invented spam. 
How many asked for that catalog? Huh? He just sent it home to anyone, to everyone. So the lessons learned here is basically that you need to be very clear in innovating in your sales formula. How can you get the frequency to interact with your delight into your business model? How do you play around with this? And how can you actually work with these things? Because if you're great in frequency but suck in delight, well, you have a challenge. Same thing if you have a great delight and you have great frequency built in, but you have no business model over time, you can succeed if you sell your company maybe, but it's going to be tough. But how do you get all of these things to work together? Because if you do, you can change the game. So let's ask a question. Is it the big that beat the small? Or is it the fast that beat the slow? It should say down there. Is the fast that beat the slow? Is that correct? I think that's you know, what we brought up with in all startup. Yes, it's really important. It's the fast that beat the slow. But I think I came to a very strong conclusion when I and Nicholas were sitting down and having lunch. We said, we always said to each other, it's now, it's the fast that beat the slow. But then we looked at each other and said, no, it's actually right now, it's the big that beat the small. We're big. What had happened? It became a defined marketplace. So are you in a red ocean? Are you defined by fixed rules? Or are you in a blue ocean? Because here, swim like hell. This is where the fast beat the slow. Here, it's a defined industry. It's the big that beat the small. And when I look at companies, I look at entrepreneurs and everything, you need to define yourself. Are you a game changer? That are willing to go against the establishment, do everything your own way? Or are you an outperformer? This is what we get teached at school. This is often, you know, 99% of all work. We outperform existing companies. We do it harder, faster, better. If you're big, you will win. But if you want to change the world, you also need to sacrifice maybe a lot of all your old friends. I had some of my best friends leave me, walk out the table in Silicon Valley when I said, you know, I'm investing in rocket internet. And they're like, that's madness. But for me, they were game changers. They were willing to establish and challenge the existing society and the existing ways of doing investments. But it's very hard to mix. And if you go back, if you have time to read one book, I'd say read Clayton Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma. Because it's very seldom these guys that innovate in the chairlift. And it's very seldom that the chairlift guys innovate in the flying probe. Because these guys laugh at these guys. Who wants to go up in the chairlift with a hammock? <laughs> Useless. These guys today are laughing at these guys. You know, people are trying to fly up the mountain in probes, electrified <laughs> aircrafts. People are dying. It's not OK by the FAC. So they will not invent that. That will probably come out of it somewhere else. And this is proven. So the only thing I'll, I'll say summarizing this, want to change the world, you need to take risk. You need to be accepting the fact that you will probably fail, because a lot of the game changers will fail. And when you look at an idea, you can get McKinsey to do this amount of slides of everything. They'll jump through every goddamn hoop you pay them for. And they'll tell you it's a great idea. But often, from my perspective, you get that feeling in your stomach. Is it a good idea or not? And you get that in that elevator pitch, that friction-free story. So thank you. That was all for me. <laughs>